after I'd left the military, I was running around teaching military and Marine Corps and Army and law enforcement all these skills because it kept them alive. But what really started the program for me is this situation right here, is when a good friend of mine called me the day after the Las Vegas massacre, and he started to tell me about how his daughter was at that massacre not less than 24 hours prior. I know his daughter, I've met her on plenty of times, and he's explaining to me how she was in the middle of this gun massacre. And I'm getting, you know, all choked up because I, I don't know what happened to her. I don't know if she's still alive in the middle of this conversation. And he finally tells me, he goes, Yusuf, she's fine. My daughter's fine. She was able to get out of there. And the reason he called me is because I taught him one of these specific behaviors that we're going to talk about in the next five minutes. And he secondhand taught his daughter this information. She never even heard it from me, heard it from her dad. And she has no background in military law enforcement, but she's standing there in the middle of that a Las Vegas event with her boyfriend and some friends, and the first volley of shots ring out. She goes, she gets a bad gut feeling. She goes, you know what? Based on what my dad told me, A plus B plus C, that's enough information for me. I'm getting the heck out of here. And she grabs her boyfriend's hand and she starts moving to the fence line. As she's moving away, her friends are like, hey, stop freaking out. It's just fireworks. And she's going, fireworks in the middle of the concert at, at night. I can't even hear the music. That doesn't, that doesn't fit. So she goes, you know what? I'm going to trust my dad. I'm going to trust my gut. I'm out of here. And she's dragging her boyfriend out of there. As she gets to the edge of the fence, edge of the fence line, that's when the next volley of shots ring out and people start dying. And it's like, oh my God, it's an active shooter event. But she's already beaten feet with her boyfriend. She's already out of there. So while there was no, there was maybe some mental trauma there, no physical damage had been done. This kind of made me sit back and kind of look at my life and going, wow. That's a lot of, there's a lot of impact of some of these skills and a lot of people that need these skills. When I train military and law enforcement, all those people, hey, they need these skills too, but at least they have other types of training, maybe not specifically this, survival training, mental training, all that good stuff. But I really made a hard turn to our communities, our churches, our synagogues, because that's exactly where we need this. Because often our communities are starting from zero. They got none of these skills, all right? So let's get started on educating our community in this stuff. So what is it? What is science-based situational awareness? If I ask people to define situational awareness, if I asked you and you and you and you, we are all in a group of room, I'd ask you to define it. I guarantee we'd probably get 10 different definitions of what situational awareness. Not necessarily a bad thing because situational awareness can apply to your position. A fireman has to have different situational awareness than a cop or someone in the military, as opposed to someone who's a teacher or, or a pastor, all different types. But you have to have some level of situational awareness. So what is it? Establish good situational awareness, no matter where you're at in life, whether you're in all these high violence situations or whatever it is, you have to understand the baseline and anomaly. If you walk around all day, every day, you should be uh, establishing behavioral baselines on everywhere you go. Everything's got a baseline. And all a baseline is, is what should be? What is the norm? What should I be seeing? So when I go to Starbucks, the same Starbucks every mon Monday at nine o'clock in the morning, it should be relatively the same baseline as every other Monday at nine o'clock morning, all right? But if you don't establish these baselines and you walk around in life not even knowing what the baseline of your own area is, you'll never see that anomaly coming. Okay, what's the anomaly? That's the anomaly is the thing that's going to roll over you whether you're making a decision or not. That's the shooting. That's the bombing. That's the, the, the mugging. Whatever bad event you don't want to be a part of is that anomalous behavior. So we establish a baseline and we look for deviations. We look for little anomalies. And that's how you walk around staying proactive every day. Oftentimes when we train people in how to react to deadly events, we're like, all right, when the shots ring out, do this. And when, when they punch you in the face, do this. OK, what's the problem with that line of training? I got to get punched in the face first for me to do anything. So let's baseline an anomaly our situation, be proactive and not just sit there and wait for bad stuff to happen and then kick into action. All right. And then the last algorithm I'll ever have to give you to keep you alive for the rest of your life is once you've established a baseline and you spot an anomaly, a behavioral anomaly or environmental anomaly, you have to make a decision. You got to make a decision. All right. I can't tell you what that decision is. I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm saying if you get baseline plus anomaly, something's jumped up on your Richter scale enough to make you look at it. You need to make a decision. Is that decision go tap them on the shoulder and start asking them questions? Is that decision to grab your family and get the heck out of that venue immediately and call the cops down the street as you're driving away briskly? Could be. I don't know. But all I'm telling you is once you have a baseline and you spot an anomaly, you got to make a decision. That bang event, that violent event is not waiting for you to make a decision. It will roll right over you. No problem. So 
Also, when you're making your observations, you can't run around freaking out and being paranoid all the time. Everyone thinks that I'm going to teach you to be paranoid. That's the worst thing you can be is paranoid. That's the last thing I want you to do. Think about it. If I'm paranoid, if I'm making you paranoid, when you walk out the door of your house every day, you're literally looking for threats everywhere behind that bush, behind that door. Your brain cannot fat, your brain cannot handle that level of information all the time. You're, you're redlining. It's called hypervigilance and you're going to burn out. And guess when you're going to burn out? Murphy's Law will tell you you're going to burn out right when you need to pay attention because you've been running around spending your attention on everything else that doesn't matter. So paranoid is the last thing you need to be. I want to build in confidence by teaching you these specific indicators. So one of those things when we're establishing baselines and anomalies in our Starbucks and our homes, you got to make sure you're viewing things within context and relevance. You can't just freak out all the time. So if I just dinged everybody here on the head and I'm like a, 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 an episode of Law and Order, I just made you a detective, a narcotics detective, and we're going to go serve a warrant on this house that has like 50 pounds of dope on it, right? Um, and let's say you knock on the door, you walk through the living room, you walk into the kitchen. In the kitchen, what are some things you see in the kitchen? Pots, pans, plates, microwave, blender, coffee maker. Cool. All right. Are all those items within context of that kitchen? Yeah, they all kind of fit things that should be in a kitchen. Nothing's really crazy there. So are they really relevant to a threat or my situation right now? Eh, not really, unless I get more information. But put it another way, instead of walking into the kitchen of this dope house, I walked into the garage first. Now, when I walked in the garage, I see pots and pans and microwaves and coffee filters and coffee makers. Does the context the same there? Do those items match? No. Those items should be in a kitchen. Did they become relevant to my investigation? I don't know. Maybe now, because that definitely is a deviation from my baseline. So we're always walking around establishing baseline, looking for those anomalies proactively, but also looking at things within context and relevance, right? When it comes to anomalies, how many anomalies is enough? When should I go up and do something? When is my, my trigger line? When is my point to act? Well, I say keep it grouped in threes. Make three observations, then decide. That's the best thing I can tell you. And why do I say when you make three observations, make a decision? Why do I not say 33, all right? 33 is more information. If I sit here and think about it, if I get 33 more decisions, that's more information, right? Well, in a critical incident, in violence, you don't have an infinite amount of time to make that decision. The 70% solution right now is way better than 100% solution when someone is shooting at you, when you figure out the, the solution after the fact. So get to three observations, make a decision. Are you going to be right 100% of the time? No. There might be some times where you have to apologize for whatever you do or say, but at least you'll be right more often than you're wrong once you use science-based observable indicators to establish these baselines. So always keep that stuff grouped in threes, all right? So I mentioned it a couple of times, the left to bang mindset. What is that? This is the, 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 the capstone to all the behavioral trends I teach is the left to bang mindset. And what it says is this. Think of an incident timeline. You have bang right there in the middle. Bang is your active shooter, your mugging, your rape, your murder, whatever horrible bad event that we don't even want to deal with. And then you have everything post event, everything right of bang. All the things we do, call 911, medical, evacuate people. There's things that bad people do after the fact. Yep, all their events. So we got to understand that you have to know how to re react to events. Cool, I understand that. But there's a whole other side of the coin we've been missing for a long time. Everything left of bang. When, when when bad guys come up with a plot, do they just wake up in the morning, pop up and go, all right, I got a full criminal plot now and walk out the door and enact that plot? No, sometimes it takes a day or a week or an hour or something to plot out some uh, act and conduct some type of behavior. And if we can spot that little behavior left of bang, and you can be five seconds, 10 seconds left of bang, hell, you could be two weeks left of bang. You pull on that little indicator, pull on that little thread and bang falls apart bang unravels. The gun doesn't come on campus. So yes, we need to understand how to react to violence, but wow, left to bang is a much smarter way to do business in my book. If I can pull on a thread and pull that thing apart before it ever happens. Me having done my tours in Iraq in my Marine Corps time, I can tell you getting shot at is not very call of duty. Actually, the first time it happens to you, you're going, oh my God, I made a lot of poor decisions with my life choices. Why is this person trying to kill me right now? It's not a fun place to be. So I like to operate being in that left of bang. It's a proactive search. We're not waiting for something to happen. And then I'm going to kick into John Rambo mode. we we'll always have our head up and we're always assessing the behaviors around us. And when you do it correctly, you think that's, oh, that's a big drain on my brain. How do I make life or death decisions all day long? I'm not Jason Bourne. 
Yeah, really? You ever got in a car and driven on any type of crowded highway or traffic? You're making, you know, two second, three second, sub one second decisions on your life going 90 miles an hour in a 3000 pound vehicle. Okay. So don't give me that crap about we don't make decisions fast. We do it all every day when we're driving to work. And if someone shows you how to do this, you can do the exact same things. We're only looking for enough cues as necessary. We're not trying to build out this whole criminal plot. Violence is not waiting for you to make a decision. So get to three and do something. It's a the purpose is to make a reasonable guess. It's like a guesstimate. And if you're wrong, you can go, you know what? I apologize. But based off the science-based research that is repeatable and based off my own life history, I saw A, I saw B, I saw C. This is what I thought was going to happen. It's a reasonable inference. And the great thing is using the science-based stuff, you'll be right more often than you're wrong. And a different example, a specific example of this is let's scan this crowd real quick. This is a picture of a, um, a place in London right next to the Thames River, fairly crowded, two or three, 400 people in here. Not really the highest resolution, but just using the lens of people being close or far to each other, you could tell me who knows who. In this context of just what we learned right now, you can point to groups of people and tell me who knows who. The people holding hands know, know each other, the people that are sitting side by side, th these two couple right there. And you can actually start to look at this and dive into and ask questions like, okay, those people sitting next to each other know, know each other and they know each other, but who knows each other more? Okay, This is the proxemics behavioral domain where we start breaking out all these different inference and figuring out who's who in the zoo. It's culturally and situationally sensitive. Uh, so this can change from country to country or neighborhood to neighborhood, but it's basically the nearer I am to you, the more comfortable I am, the farther I get away from you, the more uncomfortable I am. And that's all we're looking for. This can start developing who's who in an area. It communicates a lot of things like discomfort, fear, aversion, diversion, whatever it is. And it's driven by conscious and unconscious. And what's great is most people don't even see this stuff. Most people are bumping into each other. We walk around all day, every day, and don't even see any of these behaviors. In the Western world, you can look at someone's intimate space where I only let like my kids, my family, a loved one, an intimate partner. That's about a half a foot. So if I am out in a crowd and I have no idea who anybody is, and I see two people here in America get within half a foot of each other, I can safely say those two are intimately knowledgeable with each other. They intimately know each other. They have a relationship. Okay. Could there be a situation where you might be wrong? Maybe in some type of crowded event, like an elevator or whatnot. But for the most part, that's what it is. And it can also communicate, communicate a lot of other stuff like personal, social, and public. We're going to look for the threat angle, but these are hardwired mechanisms that happen all day, every day. Just don't be this guy when it comes to the proximics because you got, probably get punched in the face. Um, what we really want to look for in terms of behavior analysis is specific proximic violations. So remember what I said, if I observe someone in a crowd and I see them come together with under, under a half a foot, hey, they're pretty comfortable with each other. But let's say I have a situation where someone walks up and they're having a conversation. Again, I don't know them. And you see someone take one step forward and you take say, you see someone take one half step back. And you see it again, one half forward, one half back. We've probably all seen this at work, at home, wherever it is. That person is telling, they're communicating to you right then and there, I am not comfortable with this person's distance. Is that some information we'd like to know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, we'd like to know. Again, this can change sometimes in crowded areas. You have to do kind of a cost-benefit analysis. And there's rules to proxemics too, which are kind of funny. If next time you get in an elevator, there's rules to an elevator. If you're in there by yourself, you sit there quietly and you kind of sit in the middle. If the door opens, you kind of give the head nod, you move to your right, and they move to the left, and you kind of give equal space, right? What happens if a third person comes in? Everyone nods at him. They, he walks in, turns around. He kind of takes center, and you all go to the back left and back right. You can look up diagrams on this stuff. There's like a, a diagrams that we follow 90% of the time in the elevator. So those are the rules of the elevator. Those are the rules of proximics. We're going to have a little fun because next time you're in the elevator, I want you to break the rules. Okay. Don't beat anybody up. Don't get punched in the face. But next time you're in the elevator, I want you to reach out to that person that you don't know. You just walked on and go, how the hell are you doing this morning? Just thrust your hand out of and watch that poor soul try to climb out of that elevator. Cause you've, you're a monster. You just broken the rules in such a horrible way. But that's what I want to do with these behavioral domains is show you discomfort. I want to show you what the rules of human behavior and violence look like. So when we spot someone out in town breaking the rules, we can go, huh, that's funny. And of all these people in this crowd right now, 
you, my friend, have all my attention. I'm going to keep watching you. So we see how that concept works, looking for little tiny behaviors to disrupt big, violent, active shooter bang type events. It works because I've seen it work in Iraq. I've seen it work in the military. I've seen it work in law enforcement. And we're seeing it work all day, every day here in the United States. So more observable indicators. I just had time to talk about some of those upper level cognitive ones, but these are all the ones we break down. Kinesics, biometrics, proxemics, atmospherics. You know, kinesics, that's considered nonverbal communication. Most people talk about body language. They're like, oh, watch the body language when you're looking for threat. That's not bad advice, but you're stopping short. Body language is just one component of kinesics or nonverbal communication. Could a head nod be a form of communi nonverbal communication? Yeah. How about me clearing my throat? How about the tone of my voice? Guys, when we're in the club and someone steps on our shoe, we got a little bit more bass in our voice. We're trying to intimidate people. We're trying to puff our chest out and look bigger. That's a hardwired observable indicator right there. And most people stop at body language. Look at that number. 60 to 65% of communication is done completely non-verbally. Some literature leave say 70%. So in terms of walking around every day with your family and threats and violence and all this wild stuff that we see in the news every day, how much are you paying attention to? I would wager probably not, not a lot. Most of the population is walking around not paying attention to any of this stuff. So if we can just increase that kinesic nonverbal communication a little bit, you can increase your safety that much more. Everyone in here listening right now, you're like a radio antenna with a certain amount of you know frequency and, and range you can get. By understanding the stuff we're talking about right now, we're juicing your antenna. Instead of a five mile range, you have like a hundred mile range of all these specific pre-event indicators and on and on and on with all these different behaviors. Some more horrible statistics to throw at you. If I, if I didn't, you know, I asked you that question in the beginning, do you think violence is going up? What is your perception of violence? Here's these horrible statistics that come out every day and all the stats will tell you, all the charts will tell you it's just going up and up and up and up. The rapes, the fatal stabbings, the aggravated assaults, mass shootings, sex offenders, missing children. We try to put in laws in place. We try to litigate this evil away. You can't litigate fatal stabbing away. You can't lit you can't make a law that's going to stop rapes from happening. You can make a law that puts people in jail that do this bad stuff, but it's not going to mitigate. It's not going to disrupt any of it. The only way to disrupt this is at the event, is left of bang. If I can quickly spin up an action plan or grab someone and go, hey, Mr. Officer, I'm seeing A, B, and C. You should go do something right now. That's a much better way instead of just taking that bad person, that evil person, and just throw them in a jail. I mean, that's I, not that I'm shedding a tear, tear over that, but it's not mitigating any of this bad stuff. So that's why I keep screaming all this stuff from the top of my lungs. CCT ca cameras, uh, your ring central, your, your surveillance cameras. Cameras are a great tool, but guess what? Cameras don't do anything. They don't mitigate anything. They just let you watch the violence on record over and over again. Watch how many times you couldn't didn't do something to stop that violence from happening. So all this stuff we talked about. I talked about applying this to active shooters, human trafficking, violent protests, sexual harassment. Again, we're here to aid violence. If your problem is people, the safe instructor addresses that problem. Any type of time we have a human being that's ready or plotting violence, we can apply that to. If I my, my business has an active shooter problem, we need active shooter, all you do is take the safe training behavior modules and just rejigger it and talk to them about active shooter. If I want to talk about sexual assault, sexual harassment, and suicidal ideation, guess what? All the behavioral domains still the same, stay the same. You just move them around a little bit and you make your presentation follow that. I did that for a, a unit in the military one time, and I'd never done it before. I had no background in sexual assault, sexual harassment, suicidal ideation. I wasn't educated, but I had an education in the safe training program, and I started putting pen to paper, and I went and knocked it out of the park, and they came back to me, and I'm not tooting my own horn. They're like, that is the best sexual uh, assault, sexual harassment class we've ever got. Why? It's not because of me. It's because the behavioral domains and the skills we teach you at the SAFE program give you real tangible processes to do, not just be like, hey, be on the lookout for this. And if you see someone who might be disturbed, there are the often these vague, random, like, I don't know, kind of wishy-washy indicators where in the SAFE program, you take those specific indicators and apply it to whatever human violence you're dealing with. So we've talked about that. We've covered everything. At this point, you basically have two options. If you're still sitting here listening to me, you have two options. Option one, don't do anything. Just be a spectator. Take what I've given you today. Take the information. It's good information. It's going to absolutely help you one of these days in life. I know that for a fact. 
but don't do anything and just hold it to yourself. That's one option. I don't like that option. I'm not going to judge you for it, but it is an option. And the other one is to take action, is to actually do something with the words you heard today. If at this point you're still listening to me and you're still at passion and you're like, wow, this is really interesting stuff that I can employ and I can help my community, you got to do something about it. You got to make a difference because when I make instructors, I'm going to teach you the one thing you have to be as an instructor is you have to have and maintain a bias for action. You have to maintain a bias for action. You need to do something. I used to tell my Marines, if it's going down, it's like an Alamo situation. And, I, you know, I haven't told you what to do in the last 10 seconds. You better start screaming orders. You better go down screaming orders. I don't even care if those orders make sense, but you better start screaming something now because the 70% solution right now is way better than that 100% solution later. So do something with the information you have. Go tell a neighbor, go tell a friend, or join my safe instructor program and we'll get these skills out at scale and develop a side income for you. The world desperately needs it. There's people running around, bumping into each other. Everyone's stuck in their phone and they have zero situational awareness skills, okay? I'd love to come in here and make you 200% more aware of your surroundings, what this program does. But if all I can do is get our communities 1% more aware, 2% more aware, 5% more aware of their surroundings, what do you think that would do to crime and violence and all these horrible things like rape and stabbing? Statistically, you think it'd dial it down? I think it would definitely make a difference. So click below on that link to get those monthly options and help me. I, again, I've been screaming this stuff from the top of the hills for 15 years. It's finally just starting to get traction. We got over a thousand instructors out there teaching this great skills, helping our communities, getting a lot of great feedback from people, but it's not over. I need help. So click that button and I'll see everybody on the other side.